All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a jam-packed session today with tremendous resources among us on this panel. My name is Jessica LaBarbera. I'm a vice president at Nonprofit Finance Fund. We are a national community development financial institution, which means that we lend money into the nonprofit sector. And like my peers here, we're involved with innovative investments that support all of the good work that organizations and communities are doing to close the opportunity gap using financial mechanisms and investments beyond grant making. So I am thrilled to be moderating this panel today. We have just a fascinating and incredibly diverse membership of panelists here today who are really on the front lines of using a variety of investment tools to increase the impact of their foundations giving an impact uh, in under-resourced communities. They are achieving positive results socially as well as financially in terms of increasing their funding and financing that's enabled by things like micro-lending, program and mission-related investing, outcomes-based and impact investing. So we're going to dive right in because, as I said, we really do have a lot of great information to share with you, and we'd very much like the opportunity to engage in dialogue with everyone in the room. So what we're going to do is ask each of the panelists to share a bit about the innovative financing and work that they're doing beyond grant making with you first, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. So please note them, and we'll come, we'll come right back. So Sandra, we're going to start with you and, and the work that the California Healthcare Foundation is doing through the Health Innovation Fund. So as I understand it, this is the foundation's first program-related investment fund that invests in communities and services that help improve care delivery to advance the foundation's mission. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about how the foundation got into this line of work. What led you to use PRIs to develop the Health Innovation Fund? Great. Well, it's really nice to be here. Um, uh, I'm Sandra Hernandez, I'm the President and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation. I've only been there not quite two years, but this program was started uh, really under the rubric of um, uh, innovations for the underserved. Uh, it really grew out of a program that had been focused on service innovations, pilots, um, that had traditionally been just that, pilots that were funded with grant dollars. You would test the pilot, you would fund the pilot, you would evaluate the pilot, the funding would be gone, and then generally speaking, the pilot either wouldn't be sustained or certainly wouldn't be scaled. And here we are, we're sitting, our headquarters, we're a statewide foundation, but we're headquartered in Oakland. Um, and we began to see that there were a lot of uh, emerging new disruptive companies uh, that were beginning to get into the space around uh, improving uh, convenience, accessibility, uh, discharge planning, uh, registration, things that could operationally significantly potentially be disruptive innovations that could help the public delivery system, this delivery system that has historically served the multiple chronic population, and typically uh, low income, often very disenfranchised from the healthcare system. And so there was a decision made that we would create a fund, an innovation fund, where we would vet uh, startup, early stage startup. This is fairly unusual because many foundations do PRIs, and this is a pretty traditional PRI program. But the thinking uh, was largely that if we could get in in very early stages of companies, we could help the companies think about their marketing and expansion and scale with an eye towards scaling within the public sector. And because of our grant making program and a long program in the underserved, we of course have relationships with FQHCs and public hospitals and really all of the safety net delivery system. And a lot of times you have companies that have great innovations but don't have the relationships and networks or understand the way the financing and the operations of the public sector works. And so it was partly about getting them to think about how their innovation might be workable, but also quite importantly, trying to make the connections to the entities that you could introduce them to. And so we started doing showcases to be able to bring innovative companies to have CMOs and quality officers and enrollment people and oper operational folks to begin to look at what the opportunity was. These are largely five-year structured deals. They're deals that typically are, um, are uh, uh, convertible debt, oftentimes with a little bit of warrant uh, on top of them. 
Um, the investment strategy is really just to get repaid. If it were a grant, we'd never get it repaid. Um, if we simply get the loan back at the rate that we've negotiated, we consider that a financial win. So this really isn't an asset management, endowment management strategy. It was really about how to recapitalize our grants program, but doing it in a way that, uh, that was uh, really using a new mechanism of these startup companies. We typically take a observer seat, not a voting seat, on uh, the companies that we invest in. And uh, really importantly, um, we believe that our role is really to advise them to help these uh, uh, services and or products get a take hold uh, in the public delivery system. We vet a ton of companies, as you might imagine, there are many more companies than you could possibly do. When we started this program, there were two people running the program. Today, there are four. We've got about uh, $10 million today that are invested in a little over nine companies. Um, and uh, we've learned a lot. One of the things that we require as part of our investment in a company is that the foundation also commissions an independent evaluation of the effort in the public sector with the commitment that those evaluations will be made public, whether there was an impact or not. Um, interestingly, we have longer conversations about that than we do the rate of interest uh, on, the, on the debt. Um, uh, but in all, in all cases, the companies have agreed to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there except to say that we do use a couple of very important criteria as we vet and think about companies. And the criteria is typically that, it, uh, that you are able to do one of two things. Either reach a substantial population of our targeted underserved, historically underserved population, uh, an example would be uh, 5,000 of the highest cost members of a local Medi-Cal plan in the Inland Empire. Uh, it's a population that's using $35,000 a year worth of services and have very poor outcomes against other members in that plan who are using $5,000 and have much better outcomes. Um, and so it is both a criteria around population reached and generally speaking at full scale in the business plan, you have to be able to reach about 25,000 lives and or achieve an annual savings in the public sector, and you could talk about where the savings goes, of about $25 million to a public program. Um, that just allows us to do a screen quickly about whether or not it can reach the population that we're targeting. And then, of course, there is, okay, in that space, are all programs equal? Uh, and the answer to that, of course, is not. And uh, one of the things we have done with the fund over time is try to be a little bit more targeted about what kinds of companies we're looking at and really focus there on how to improve the delivery system to take up this very large Medicaid expansion that we've seen in California. So I'll stop there and open it up to other questions. Great. Thank you, Sandra. We're going to just continue down the line and introduce you to all of the diverse investments, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about some of the experiences of, of the folks on the panel as well. So Eric, hi. Welcome. Eric is the founder and CEO of the Opportunity Fund, which has a tremendous track record in domestic microfinance, which, as I understand it, far exceeded the expectations you had for the program at its start. Additionally, the fund is known for its micro savings programs for students preparing for college. And I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about the organization's roots and how your experience over the last 20 years or so has surprised you. Sure. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm really thrilled about the title of today's uh, gathering, The Opportunity Gap. We've, we've been talking about it for a number of years at Opportunity Fund, and uh, not that we were the first ones to say it, but certainly is... Um, the way we're thinking about things. Um, <clears throat> so I would say there are sort of two key things that are led, uh, sort of the, the route that led to the creation of Opportunity Fund. The first is that a community organizer decided to go to business school, and that was, that was me back in 1990, um, a move that anyone who knew me then was very shocked by. Uh, and the second was that uh, Bill Clinton got elected in 92, and um, made it clear that he was going to uh, enforce the Community Reinvestment Act for the first time. And that's a law, you're probably all familiar with it, that requires banks to uh, do meaningful things for the entire spectrum across, uh, across the economic spectrum. And uh, coming out of business school, I saw the CRA as a real lever that could be used to get some uh, additional resources into low-income communities. A, a number of people did. Um, 
So I was, I ran into a, uh, it was actually the Silicon Valley Community Foundation that, um, that uh, had brought together a group of banks around that time to sort of brainstorm on what they might do. These were all small banks. And I'd come out of school, I had this, I had my MBA, so they thought maybe I would be able to help them with this problem. And I had this background as a community organizer and affordable housing developer. And we organized a consortium of banks to uh, start making loans to small businesses and to nonprofit affordable housing developers. And we, at this time, we knew nothing about international microfinance. I mean, I, I might have vaguely heard of the Grameen Bank or something, but none of the bankers had. And it, and it wasn't kind of the model that we were pursuing. We were just looking for a way to help the banks with an, a, a need they had and for me to do something about communities that I'd always cared about. <clears throat> um, we struggled in the early years in San Jose. We were, we were struggling to make 20 to 30 loans a year. And this went on for a long time. Um, and then in 1999, we got into savings uh, because we recognized that not everyone was an entrepreneur and we really wanted to you know, have uh, something that could be more broadly useful to families that, that weren't entrepreneurial. And we also liked the idea of working on both sides of a family's balance sheet, you know, the, both the, uh, the asset side and the credit side. Uh, and it was the savings that really went to scale first for us. We were very quickly uh, in, in enrolling four to 500 people a year into the program who were saving for college so they could graduate with less debt. And it was that scale that kind of gave us a kick in the pants to think, you know, with our micro lending is really kind of languishing here, we're not doing very much, how can we scale it up? And there were many, many things led to that, but the, the reality is that we, <clears throat> first thing we did is we expanded geographically from San Jose up to the rest of the Bay Area. And then in two, 2010, we uncovered a really unique opportunity to come to Southern California by um, partnering, with, initially partnering with and then merging with a for-profit microfinance lender that was focused on the Latino community in four counties in, in Southern California. We ended up merging that organization into Opportunity Fund, and our lending has been growing very, very fast ever since. Um, last fiscal year, we made over 800 microloans in Southern California, which was about half of what we did overall, and that totaled $17 million, um, again, about half of a little less than half of what we did overall. And we're going to um, be north of $20 million in Southern California this year. Um, talking about the surprises, yeah, I um, my goals for the organization were very modest at the beginning. It was just, you know, wanted to um, provide an opportunity to some people who weren't uh, able to access uh, financial products that, that were uh, empowering to them. Um, never with, you know, any idea that we would soon have, that we would ev eventually have the largest portfolio of micro lenders in the country. So um, I guess I'm surprised that I'm still here uh, 23 years later. There, uh, and I'm really surprised, I guess, also that some of the people that have been on the journey with me, we've been, you know, I've got a phenomenal team of people that um, could be doing a lot of other things. That's probably my biggest surprise. Great. Thank you, Tom. Christy is a managing partner with Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, which is a venture philanthropy modeled after the venture capital industry and makes bets on early stage organizations. So, Christy, could you just tell us a little bit about your organization and your model, how it's different, how it works, just to begin? Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, so the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, we're a venture philanthropy firm, which means we're not an endowed foundation. Uh, we raise money about every five years from high net worth individuals, and for the first time um, in this, our third fund, we're raising money from institutions. So we're thrilled that the Conrad Hilton Foundation was the first established foundation to join us, um, and a number of other foundations followed in their footsteps, um, including Packard, Hewlett, uh, Kresge, Davidson, and um, we hope a few more to follow. So um, really can't thank Ed enough for having us here. Um, but at Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, we were early supporters of Kiva, of Room to Read, um, Little Kids Rock, which is the single largest provider of free music in the United States today. Um, as well as education pioneers. We were early in all of those organizations, um, and today we have both an office in Menlo Park, California, as well as in Boston. So I just wanted to get back to the structure that we have, um, and also wanted to say that I can't thank um, Warren Buffett enough for making the grant to the Gates Foundation, because I think that that fundamentally transformed <coughs> philanthropy um, in this country. And we, I joined an organization six years ago called, 
six years ago, and it was just Draper Richards Foundation, and I was dead wrong, but I thought we would have to change the name in order to raise substantial money from other individuals. Um, since then, we've had over 40 individuals and foundations join us um, and commit their capital to, and, and, and give us decision rights to choose which nonprofits are gonna be the most innovative and make a big, tr have transformative change in our, in our, in our world, um, all around the world. Um, and it's interesting that every five years we reset our, our strategy. So we will look and say, is this the right duration? We fund for three years, we give 300,000. We've done that for the last 12 years. Our alumni and our and the grantees will always tell you what you suspect, right? You should give us more money. Um, and we went out and looked at, well, what would, be, what would happen if we did an inflation adjustment? And it would just be another, 150,000, and we figured, well, is that really, is that gonna make the difference? Um, because then we would be able to fund fewer organizations, and we really grappled with that over the last year, thinking about, is it really about the money? And what we came to is it's not about the money. Um, it's really about the support that we provide, and I think that that's what's innovative, most innovative about the venture capital approach, which is we're highly selective in who we support. This year we'll support eight, 18 organizations, uh, we'll be with them for three years. We'll sit on their board. We are a very engaged funder. When the grantees come in and they apply to us, I say this is a two-way street. You have to decide if you were the right partner for you um, because whatever plan you put forward, which is a, usually a three-year plan that we ask them to put forward to us, we're gonna be pushing you aggressively to make sure that you've, you are working toward that long, ambitious goal and that you're data-driven and that you're constantly experimenting and testing if this is the best way to have impact against that important problem. Um, so always early stage. We don't think there's enough um, early stage bets being made by philanthropy. We love all of you. We'd love to see you give more unrestricted support to um, innovative, high, like think about Eric when he first started. They were struggling to make those first 20 loans today. There's what, 800? That, 1,600. I mean, we have to start somewhere. We have to be able to willing, be willing to take some risk. And it's in the, the failures and in some of the most challenging nonprofits that we've learned the most about transformative change. Um, and so, um, and we believe that sitting on that board is also a way to get into a partnership with a nonprofit so that you are focused on the end game that they are also focused on. Um, and you're pushing them to give them the resources, be an ambassador to them, help them connect with government or with private industry. Um, and so what we do is we have an open application process. We fund, um, we, anyone can apply to us at any time. We have a rolling admissions, you know, or a rolling due diligence process. We try and keep the diligence process down to four months. Um, because we believe that these innovations need to be tested um, quickly and that we should either get on board or let them go their own way. Um, and we're focused on looking at the leader, the opportunity to scale or have a substantial change, um, a sustained change in an organization, as well as what, how would the organization or the system be different as a result of this innovation happening. Okay. And we're gonna fund 100 organizations in the next five years and we'd love to see more come out of the Southern California area. So if you have something that you think might fit our criteria, send it my way. We'd be more than open to taking a look. If it's not been diverse enough for you, we're gonna throw Tom Parker into the mix, who's the CEO of the Hutton Parker Foundation. Uh, over the past 17 years, Tom's foundation has doubled its, its assets by investing in the community as opposed to traditional Wall Street assets. So, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this work and what you're doing to achieve these results? Yeah, I, definitely different. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying the reason I got into this was for tax reasons. <laughs> um, and so that's fine. Sold a company, put the money in the foundation like a lot of the donors out here have. And then all of a sudden, I realized I had to give away 5%. That's okay. But what did I do with the other 95? I gave it to Wall Street. And that just... I don't, I'm sorry if they're brokers out there. They aren't, I'm, I've never been really happy with Wall Street. Um, I never felt that they were really my friends, so I decided, wait a minute, let's try a different way to do this. And I started thinking, okay, I'll start loaning money to nonprofits, PRIs. The IRS likes it if foundations do it. So a whole bunch of great reasons to do it. I think we did 50 of them. Then we turned around and I 
thought, well, wait a minute. Um, how about buildings, real estate? The beauty of real estate with, for a nonprofit use is you're gonna, there's some great things, and I don't have time to talk about them, but great advantages to foundations. But more importantly, it was a super way to help nonprofits. Nonprofits pay me rent at a reduced rate, pay me, pay the foundation rent. That rent they pay goes back to make other grants, the whole thing circles. And I turned around and all of a sudden we have 18 nonprofit centers, um, most of them in Santa Barbara County. We have 100 nonprofits, they work together. It's, it's a great system and, and it, it works wonderfully. We then did some other things. We bought a local bank or a piece of a bank and started doing what you're talking about with our, with our assets right in our own community. So it's all well and good and about two years ago I decided, okay, the foundation, how is it now? How would I have done if I would have stopped, just used the old model? Took off for three months, decided to write a book. By the way, writing a book with, is not that hard. If you have dragon, you talk into a microphone. Um, and I, I was so proud, I finished this book. Three months, I worked very hard on it. I took off to Hawaii to do it. I came back, I put it in front of my best friends. It was about 240 pages. I said, well, what do you think? And he looked up at me and said, Tom, who do you think you are? This is really self-indulgent. So I spent more time condensing that thing down to um, 75 pages. <laughs> it's in the back. Please take it because I don't want to carry him back home. <laughs> and by the way, the other thing I have to apologize for, and this is the truth, is the cover. The publisher and editor said, well, you have to have an Armani suit because we want to make a point. I have one on, but I'll be honest with you, I borrowed it from my son. <laughs> and that is the truth. Um, in this book, she's right. I, I put $45 million in the foundation in 96. There's over $100 million in that foundation today. We've donated $50 million during that period of time. If I would have taken the old model, and you're going to see, I think it's on page 8, you can, you can see it in the book, go back to your boards, show them that this works. If, if you would have taken the old model, 70% in index funds and 30% in bonds, today, today, you wouldn't have had $100 million, you'd have $38 million, and you would have donated only about 50% as much. And that's the truth, and that's what's happened from 96 to today to a lot of foundations in your own community. And you can see that that happens when they have to donate 5% and they're on this roller coaster. So when somebody tells you that investing in community is, is great and it feels good and it's a, the right thing to do, it can be the financial right thing to do. You just have to think outside the box a little, and there are, there are safe, great ways Read the book, it's easy, I promise. And it's not self-indulgent anymore, I'm hardly mentioned in there at all. <laughs> and, uh, and you're welcome to call us too, we're up in Santa Barbara, but it's all in there, so. Great, thank you, Tom. Well, uh, continuing on with this pattern of out-of-the-box thinking, we have Christina Altmeyer, who's the Executive Director of the Children and Families Commission in Orange County. So like first five organizations across the state, the Children and Families Commission is facing declining revenues that have forced the organization to look at critically um, the sustainability of its programs and its investments. So CFCOC is exploring pay for success as a mechanism of engaging other agencies that are interested in the outcomes created by their maternal health screening programs, um, who are interested also in funding preventative work. So Christina, with that lengthy introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about the trajectory of your exploration, how you got there, what you're seeing? Great, well thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. Very excited to be here. Um, as I said, as Jessica said, I'm with uh, the Children and Families Commission of Orange County, uh, also known as First Five. We're one of the 58 First Five County Commissions throughout the state. And was very excited this morning to hear uh, multiple speakers uh, recognize the importance of early childhood. So that was a good plug for what we're very passionate about. Um, so we have a unique challenge. Uh, when Proposition 10 was passed back in 1998, there was a recognition that as a tobacco tax revenue, we were anticipated and have had declining revenue every year. So one of the things that we know for sure is in three years, we will have less revenue than we had today. We have had a decline of about 45% of revenue since our peak back in 2000. 
So we have this challenge of declining revenue, and yet we have an equally important challenge of building um, integrated systems of care for young children and to be outcome focused. So from day one, and as we make these investments, we have to be thinking about how are these investments going to be sustained, because another provision within the first five legislation that the voters of California passed is that we cannot um, supplement what is already being funded. We had to make new investments to really, I believe, change the system of care for young children and to make some bold investments. So the commission um, has had a history of trying to be innovative in this field and really to maximize all the available revenue, whether it was trying to draw down more federal revenue um, and training nonprofits on how you can bill more effectively or partnering with other foundations or in, in um, some cases doing what I would consider pretty unique for a quasi-government organization where we made upfront payments to organizations, um, one-time upfront payments, and then expected them to provide a steady level of services for 10 years, which gave them a lot of flexibility in implementation and also helped them attract on their funders. So we had an appetite, I would say, for doing some innovative strategies, which led us to explore pay for success. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of pay for success. Basically, what it tries to do is a strategy in which new investors are mitigating the risks that nonprofits have by investing in new service strategies. And the risk for government, who is traditionally the back-end payer, is mitigated because they only uh, pay back, so to speak, when outcomes are achieved. And there's been a number of different models around the country. There's one in Salt Lake City around preschool. There's uh, Chicago. And there's been, in California, the first pay for success initiative that was just announced by Santa Clara County to focus on homeless. For us, we're in a unique position because we're really advocating for this as a strategy on behalf of the nonprofits that we fund. So if you think about it, um, we are what I would call the upfront payer or the entrepreneurial payer who is saying these investments, in the case that we're looking at, it is um, home, universal hospital-based screening for all newborns and then referral based on risk to home visitation strategies. And we have been funding this program for 15 years, and now we are saying, look, there are significant benefits that are realized to systems, be they health systems, be they the social service system, or in some cases the education system, by this early intervention strategy that we have. And we have right now focused first on the health um, system. And as you would expect, the majority of moms that are receiving these services are low income at significant risk um, for a number of different factors. And we believe that through our early intervention, we're improving health outcomes for those moms. And we're trying to, in a very rigorous way, demonstrate both the positive outcomes to the health system as well as the cost savings to the health system. And this is different, um, what I've learned is that doing this type of rigorous evaluation is different than saying these are the outcomes that are achieved. A mom is achieving, let's say, a more stable relationship and increasing the maternal bonding between child and mom. Um, it is more than saying that the, child, the mom reached her postpartum visit. It is looking at the outcomes that we achieve and very specifically looking to our partners to say, which of these outcomes is so important to you that you would actually pay for them? So in the case of the healthcare system, it's saying that it is really important to CalOptima, who's the managed care organization in Orange County for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. We know it's really important to you that mom receives early prenatal care. It's important to you because it's one of the factors that are rating you as a health system. We know it's really important to you that a child is fully immunized by age two. We know it's really important to you that a mom receives her postpartum visit. So we are trying to quantify in terms that are important to the healthcare system the outcomes that our intervention is providing and then motivating them to become a payer in that system. So it's a, it's a, I think it's ch different than what we have done in terms of saying what are the outcomes that we receive, and it's changing the conversation that we have to have with health systems 
to very specific metrics of success that are important and valuable to those organizations. And happy to talk more about how we've approached that evaluation. So you can see we have an incredibly diverse group of folks here doing really innovative things to achieve outcomes and really track those outcomes. I'm curious to just hear from the room a bit. How many of you have experimented with uh, investments beyond grant making? How many folks have done PRIs in their foundations? How many folks are thinking about it? Okay. How many folks are just, you know, maybe here because this is the most interesting panel and, you know, maybe down the line our foundation will consider something like this? A few, brave cells, great. Well, knowing that, let's talk a little bit about some of the, um, the surprises, the challenges, you know, the learnings that you've had. Sandra, would you tell us a little bit about, you know, this is CHC's, uh, excuse me, the Healthcare Foundation's first PRI, correct? It's the first fund. The first fund. This is the okay. way I would think about it. What have been some of the challenges that you've had with the fund? Um, well, I think uh, one of the things was that when we first started, um, the breadth of companies that you could potentially invest in were uh, pretty wide. Um, and if you use the underserved as sort of your criteria, a lot of things fit into it. So we did some stuff on um, you know, measurement of use of asthma inhalers. Um, foundation wasn't really doing work in air quality or asthma per se as part of our programmatic work. And so I think one of the things we recognize is that to really utilize the full network capability and relationships of the foundation for the benefit of the companies and the underserved, we needed to be more specific about what kinds of interventions the delivery system could most benefit from. So we started with a fairly broad portfolio of companies, um, a pharmaceutical company, for example, that helps rural and essential hospitals who have a really hard time paying full-time pharmacists to work for them. Um, organize them in a network such that the company that we funded could actually work through the network to reach them. Um, and really understanding that oftentimes this is an investment in the company, but it's also an investment in the relationships and also potentially priming it. So we gave a grant to the group that was organizing the essential hospitals so that they actually had somebody who could be the receptacle for the company intervention that you're trying to fund. And so I think this is part of this question about uh, what does being engaged in an investment look like? Uh, and how do you do that when there are other investors at the table that may have other interests in where that company goes? Um, so that's one, one area. I think the other area has been, interestingly enough, there are some companies that have been bought, for example, and when they get bought early stage, you know, the, many of the new buyers would like to retire debt. And so uh, that's great. That's a success for the company. But how do we make sure the company that has now paid back the debt is still continuing with its market plan and its commitment for serving the population they're trying to serve? Um, so all of those things have been in the mix of kind of reflecting on how to continue to refine the program. We're six years out. Um, I think our interest today is uh, we had a, a very interesting interesting um, kind of marketplace. We're sort of market makers, sort of bring the companies that we've seen and that we've talked to and that we've vetted and then have potential uh, receptacle sites for them hear those presentations. And one of the things we're also trying to do is understand what that market needs, right? It helps us figure out um, who to bring and what kind of companies are valuable and then which ones we might want to invest in. So we've learned kind of uh, all the way around this. I think we see a lot of that learning that continues to influence grant making as well when we get into these alternative investments. Eric, I know that I had the assumption and I've heard from others in the field that domestic microfinance really isn't viable, that it can work internationally, can't necessarily work here. How do you account for the viability of your program? Ah, one of my <laughs> favorite questions. Um, in under two minutes. First of all, I mean, we, you know, we, we very consciously adopt the microfinance word as a way to engage people because they've heard about it internationally. What we do in some ways resembles what goes on overseas and in other ways is quite different because it's a different place. Um, <clears throat> it's true that it's scaled much more uh, slowly in the U.S. than it has overseas. There's a whole lot of reasons for that that I'm not going to go into now. I'd be happy to talk after the session. Um, but I think you have to look at your definition of viable. Um, in a, and if the definition of viable is that microfinance needs to be conducted without any operating subsidy, then it's true that no nonprofit micro lender in the U.S., small business lender, has been able to work without operating subsidy. 
I mean, that's a standard that I don't think any other nonprofit is held to, but anyway. Um, but the, in fact, there are all kinds of organizations lending money to poor people in the U.S. and making a lot of money doing it. Um, we don't call that microfinance. You might find some of the groups overseas look a lot more like a payday lender or a, a auto title lender than, than you'd, you'd, you'd think. Um, but if your definition of viable is that an organization is able, it's be able to be successful, grow, operate a sustainable model over a long period of time, and get your loans repaid, there are, are a lot of successful examples in the U.S. And, and I'm proud to say we're now, the, you know, the, the most successful, the largest, um, with our portfolio just passing 50 million in loans outstanding. Um, back on the, um, so I, you know, and what I attribute that, I think, uh, you know, running it like a business. Um, coming at it, like really tr looking at our customers the way any other business does uh, in terms of, you know, I think for a long time microfinance in the U.S., people sort of said, well, you know, we're here to help you. You don't have any other options, so we'll sit behind the desk and wait for you to come and ask for a loan, and we'll, we'll make you take 10 classes before you get the loan, and won't that be great? And you're never going to scale that way. You've got to understand that people who are in business, even if they're very small businesses, they are busy people who are, you know, hustling to make a living, and they do have other options, most of them. I mean, they, they're not very good options, but they have them. And so you've got to sell. You, you've got to sell. You've got to be able to uh, provide loans quickly. Uh, you've got to, um, you know, really, uh, you've, and you, we basically, we scaled up largely by, um, I think probably the biggest thing we did was we created a sales force of loan officers who were on incentive compensation, that is a combination, their incentive is tied to both loan volume and portfolio performance. So if they don't make good loans, they don't make any extra money, but they don't make any, any extra money if they don't make loans. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just um, chime in on the, the PRI and mission-related investing thing. I mean, I really, really encourage those of you in the room to, to think about that more seriously and <laughs> to look at us and other, other CDFIs. I mean, CDFIs are an incredible invest, incredibly safe investment if you do your homework right. Uh, I'm really pleased we've got some of our lenders here in the room, Bank of America. Uh, I don't know if Wells Fargo and Union are in the room, but they're here at the conference. California Community Foundation has lent us money. Uh, Kellogg Foundation, Skoll Foundation, uh, San Francisco Foundation, when Sandra is there. So lots of, lots of foundations have lent us money. They've all been repaid. And, you know, we have a, it's, it's, and just think about, you know, you've probably got some money sitting in, you know, some kind of bonds, corporate bonds, going to Tom's point, you know, that are earning you 3%. We can pay you that, and you can invest the money in someone like, you know, Rubens Tires in uh, Anaheim, who I just visited with. This is a guy who makes his living by going around and finding used tires and then selling them to people that can't afford to pay for new tires. And he's, you know, and he's an incredible entrepreneurial guy and he's creating jobs and he's helping people get something they need that they can't get, you know, from the tire store. If they do, they're going to get ripped off. Um, you could put your money to work at that. Even if it's not part of your main mission as a foundation, you know, just think about what good you'd be doing if you put your money to work that way. That's great. No, and it's true. I think most CDFIs have repayments rates over 98%. So certainly Can I just safe. do a little plug on Please that front, if I could? <laughs> so uh, in my prior role at the San Francisco Foundation, um, we had a long conversation about how to get into PRIs, whether to get into PRIs, how to think about risk. Um, and we ultimately decided to create a fund that really did focus on intermediaries, a.k.a. CDFIs. It's a very thoughtful, safe way as a first step to get practice. And also to help the foundation understand you need both programmatic knowledge, but you also need financial knowledge. And so there's this conundrum. Do you build it on the finance side? Do you build it on the program side? And CDFIs was for us at the San Francisco Foundation, my prior role, a very good way for the board to get into it from an investment point of view, using our programmatic expertise, but using an intermediary that was already built and quite sophisticated and could scale. So I just wanted to... Yeah, I think that's right, and I think organizations like ours do a lot to help foundations build PRI programs, get that internal financial um, and structuring success as well. Great. Christy, you talked a lot about the fact that Draper Richards Kaplan has been in a first investor in some of the most successful nonprofit organizations. I'm curious if you could share with us how you define success, how you evaluate the risk and the impact of your investments, and you know, wh how have you gotten to have so many successes in your portfolio? Right. 
Thank you. Um, well, it all starts, I think, at the diligence stage. So we look um, first at, is this a complicated, is this an important issue, usually um, addressing poverty in some significant way, and that it's a complicated issue that has been intractable for some reasons, and that there's some unique insight. Because we don't believe that we need a lot of new nonprofits in the world, actually. There's a lot of sub, sub, subscale nonprofits that are doing good work, but, you know, Maybe we could use a few more mergers in the sector. Maybe we could use a little bit more data-driven decision-making. And so we're not in the business of really starting nonprofits. Um, we're in the business of funding innovation and transformation. Then we look at the leader. Is this a person who we refer to as, are they a resource magnet? Are they the type of person, if you've ever met John Wood, or you've ever met the Kiva founders, or gosh, uh, uh, Dave Wish is about uh, nearly five feet tall, I think, and has more energy than anyone I've ever met. Um, you can just imagine him in his prior job as a first grade teacher. He, you know, would have kept them entertained for hours. But they, they bring people in. They have a, they, they are able to transfer their vision of a future world that where, where there's a, many beneficiaries and there's a, a ample resources for everyone. And they're able to paint that picture in a way that brings clarity and that people will volunteer either their time, their treasure, or their talent to that enterprise. And they have some history of um, success. And we fund a number of people right out of undergrad um, or graduate school, so they've done something in their lives that they've really demonstrated some sort of leadership. We are looking, by the way, to, to for more diverse candidates. We believe that um, it is the individuals, the entrepreneur selling the used tires, um, the people who come from challenged um, communities that are going to have unique insights into their entrepreneurs. And one of the promising young entrepreneurs that we've just funded is a woman, Veronica Scott, um, and she has started an organization called The Empowerment Plan. Um, she has a wonderful TED Talk. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to look at it, she has she grew up, um, both of her parents uh, were addicts, and she was thankfully raised by her grandparents. And she was a design student and decided that she would, uh, she was given a project that they had to design something that the homeless needed. This school project became her life's ambition, and she's now um, helping women get out of, the home, out of their status as in, uh, in Detroit as a, living in homeless shelters by making the coats, manufacturing coats that convert into a sleeping bag to give dignity to people in the, who are homeless. It's a, just a transformative experience. The other thing we look for is scale. Um, so we look for problems uh, that are large and complex. So we need to have um, models that would be um, appropriate to that. So something like Kiva that could be approached that many people can give to it, and it can be scaled over multiple countries, um, and that there's enabling legislation. One of the most promising nonprofits we're working with now is in the healthcare space. It's called Serum. They're repurposing. They're taking pharmaceuticals from a skilled nursing facility that go that, that are disposed of and getting them to a public facility, uh, a public health facility. They've in Santa Clara County. They've repurposed over 14 million dollars worth of drugs in a year. Um, the uh, potential for that to go national is tremendous, so that's what we look for. And then sustained impact. So we've got acres of land, books produced, you know, um, children touched, uh, but we're looking across these um, organizations to say, um, you know, what is the one key indicator of impact that you can measure over time and how can we go back to that? And then one quick little plug. If you're not ready to make the leap, as our board was, wasn't um, to, into PRIs, think about um, your capital that you're giving as a grant as flexible. There have been three instances that I've been involved in in the boards that I've sat on where we were trying to solve for a problem for that nonprofit. And sitting on that board and deeply understanding the financial situation of that organization, you're in a position, even if you've already pledged money, so. There's a group called Urban Teacher Center. They're a teacher residency program in Baltimore and Washington, D.C., coming to Dallas. They had a real problem. They couldn't get anyone to loan to them because they were less than three years old, and they had um, their teacher residences, uh, their teacher residents needed loans. We put our $100,000, which was our, a grant we'd already, we'd already pledged that $100,000. We said, we'll make that our first loan loss. We did all the paperwork, I got my board to approve it, and then guess what happened? Other donors came in right after us and made those pledges, and then a bank came in and said that they would 
they would fund those loans. So your money can be, if, even if you're not ready to go there, you know the nonprofit, you've funded them for a long time, they have a need, you have capital. Can you put it forward? And that's probably the, I would say that's the place to start, um, is with a relationship you already have, a trusted relationship, take a risk there, at, because actually the financial risk was fine. We didn't actually end up having to pledge our money. Somebody else gave in you know, a million dollars and we never had to pledge the money. But just by going first, we were the catalyst. Absolutely, that's a great point, Christine. As a lender to the sector, we see that all the time, that we're able to make loans that otherwise we would not because of the, those types of pledges and guarantees. So thank you for that. So Tom, you talked a lot about buying real estate, having your grantees pay you rent, being able to recycle those funds. You know, that in and of itself is certainly innovative. I'm curious if you could tell us, you know, what has surprised you most? What have been some of the biggest learnings that you've had from buying real estate for nonprofit tenants? What would you like others in the room to know? Um, well, let me start with this risk idea. Um, what, 19 years, 50 PRIs, never had a nonprofit not pay me on time, never had a nonprofit not pay off the loan. So, I mean, that's not a problem. Um, real estate, I don't know, go to your investment committees. Look at, you got 20, 30% of your assets in bonds. Well, that's great. Well, I found a way, and, the, and it's just so simple, why not invest in, in, in a building that you have nonprofits around? They need buildings. You can get a, a deal around where you are. It's so easy. You come in, you buy it, you pay all cash, you get a four or 5% return on your invested capital, which is about half of what a developer or an owner is gonna want. They're gonna want double that in a cap rate. You don't have to pay property taxes. And how about the risk, guys? That's what, you know, your investment committees, there's risk here, right? There's no risk. I've got nonprofits in my buildings. First of all, they've always paid. But what if they don't? Oh, my God. Well, I'll give them a grant to pay me. <laughs> oh, oh, well, the roof, you're going to have to make improvements. Well, they're, tripl they're tripling that lease as the tenants pay for all the improvements. Well, what if they can't pay? Okay, so we had some problems at the building. I give them a grant at the end of the year to pay me more in a cam charge. And it's fine. If I believe in their mission, that's what the foundation's there for. And you tell me at the end, when I'm getting my 4 or 5% equity, I mean cash flow, which is probably double what I could get in a bond, and I've got an asset that's appreciating 2 or 3% a year over time in real estate, tell me why that isn't better. And I've met my mission. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. And it's really not complicated. Management companies will manage it. You don't have to pay that. It's triple net leases. The tenants pay it. The tenants, the nonprofits, they're happy. Honest. I, I've got 95 of them, and they all have a smile on their face. I, I can, there are a lot of people here from Santa Barbara, and they'll, they'll tell you that that's true. And it, it works so well. So light a fire under these investment committee boards you've got, and uh, tell them it really works. Show them the book, even though they probably won't read it. Go ahead. I was just going to jump in. The Children and Families Commission of Orange County is actually located within a nonprofit village um, in Orange County. And so as a tenant, um, we found that we were kind of the crucial last piece of the puzzle. They were at about 75% uh, occupancy before we moved in. We moved in and moved them up to 100% occupancy. Plus, it also allowed um, to have an anchor tenant who had, we have, let's say, about little less than 25% of the space in the entire building. We could sign a long-term lease. Um, it allows a lot of more flexibility because most of the nonprofits aren't able to sign a long-term lease. They want to keep it to a year. So I do, I just want to say in partnership, there's an option in which other public sector agencies like myself can be part of these nonprofit villages to secure the space and provide a level of guarantee for um, supporting some of the more riskier tenants that could potentially, doesn't sound like you have any risk, but um, we, we've had you know, some risk within our nonprofit center. But, and also informally, you know, it's allowed us to have some great relationships, very informal relationships with nonprofits that we work very closely with. So just want to make that plug. Um, from a user, so to speak, of how well it's working. 
That's great. And I think, Tom, you raised an important point as well. Our, our organization helped the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation set up its first PRI as a zero-interest loan program to its arts organizations. And when we did that, we anticipated that we'd lose about 10% of that money, that organizations wouldn't be able to pay it back. And what we found was quite the opposite to your point, Tom. Because the foundation was one of their largest donors, one of their largest grant makers, they were more incentivized than anything to make sure they paid back that loan. You know, they did not want to jeopardize the hand that fed them, so to speak. So I think that was a great point that you raised, Tom, and wanted to... I just, Christina, wanted to come back to you one more time, and you know, you talked about the work that you're doing to look for alternative, more sustainable sources of funding for your preventative programs. I'm curious, as you go forward and you design and determine investments in other areas, you know, how has this affected your work? How are you thinking differently about the investments you make? What kind of cultural changes have you seen come out of this process? Um, thank you. So I would say big picture, kind of three lessons learned and take away from the experience. And we have not yet um, uh, had a pay for success transaction close yet. We are deep, deep in the middle of trying to work our way through. So the first one that um, I would say that's really become apparent is that innovations um, within the social sector and new strategies are going to require, I think, new in bringing new investors to the table. Um, and the only way we're gonna bring new investors to the table is by being very focused on outcomes. And we need to be speaking in the language of the potential investors about what are the outcomes that are important to them. Whether you're in the early childhood education arena, whether in the homeless arena, whatever, it's speaking in the language and the terms of outcomes that are important to the audience who is the potential investor. Um, secondly, and, and kind of related to that is that there is some relational um, aspect to what outcomes are important. Um, for example, again, in the health sector, we initially came up with well over 25. Our first list was 80, then we narrowed it down to 25 outcomes that we thought were um, outcomes that we could demonstrate this early intervention was achieving. We eventually whittled that down to about six to eight because those six to eight are measurable and are understandable and important to the potential back end payer. So I think it's really important to be disciplined about who is the audience and who is the investor you're trying to attract to bring to the table. Um, second point that I would just make is that this has really changed our culture going forward. So as we look at all future investments and as we even look at our existing portfolio, we are becoming much more rigorous and disciplined about what we mean by outcomes and how do we measure those outcomes and what are the specific indicators. Um, and the final comment, and that is spilling over into all of our new investments, whether we think about child welfare or, others, or um, early literacy. Um, and then the final point that I would make is that we have now, I think, started to learn how you unpack outcomes. And I'll just give you one very small example. So one of the outcomes that's really important to our Medi-Cal um, managed care organization, Cal Optima, is that moms receive their two-week visit post-birth. That's really important to them, and that is equally important to them is that the child receives their age-appropriate uh, well-child visits. So when we work back from that, and we're talking about, we think about our process as a hospital-based screening and then a referral, we have to make sure that all those processes to get that mom into the doctor's office, we're measuring them all along the way. So that means, did the referral that happened to the hospital, did that happen on a timely basis? Did the nonprofit agency follow up with that mom within 72 hours to say, you know, we have services that are available to you? Was there a step of the agency that's now working with the mom regularly following up? And all along the way, we've got to unpack that outcome so that we're measuring even those process steps to know that that eventual outcome of that mom making the postpartum visit or the child being at the well child one month visit are happening. So we've got to be disciplined not just about understanding the outcome, but all the process steps, we're gonna, which is gonna increase the likelihood of achieving that outcome. That's great, thank you. Questions from the audience? Yes, right up here in France. And Mike will make its way down there. But. <laughs> uh, my name is Gabriela Robles. I work with St. Joseph Health, so we're a health system, but we actually have a grant-making foundation. 
our finance department has what I would call a PRI. We have a loan fund. And so we partner with them very closely in identifying community partners to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. The question I have is for, for you that have the loan funds, um, is there an intentional conversation about, of the loans we give out, these are the high risk ones. We're gonna take on that risk because they may not meet the ratio requirements, but they do have the mission. And so from our perspective, we're trying to talk to our finance. We're not a bank. We're really a resource for the nonprofits. But is there, um, within this realm of work, intention about saying, we're gonna take on this percentage of risk this year and see what happens? Anyone wanna start with that? I'll tell you that, you know, in our organization, community development financial institutions have loan pools. We have loan criteria for the loans that we make. And part of the, the value and the benefit for us in partnering with foundations to create PRI programs is that we can make even riskier loans with those dollars. So with that Andrew W. Mellon Foundation program, that's 0% money. And we looked at that program. They looked at all of their grantees who are arts organizations who they funded for many years. They know well. They believe in the mission. And many of them are small, fragile organizations that we frankly would not have lent to from our traditional grant funds. And this program, in a way, served as a you know, training wheels of sorts. We did cash flow projections with them. They were held accountable for repayment. But we were able to extend the terms of their loans if they weren't able to meet them. So I think there are some examples of ways in which grant dollars or PRI dollars can be deployed as those you know, high-risk uh, funds. But would welcome any, you know, further thoughts from the, the panel, Eric or Sandra? Well, I think it's, it's really important to know um, what you're trying to achieve, right? Um, and uh, in, in, in the case of California Healthcare Foundation, we're sitting at tables with investors who are looking strictly at financial returns, right? So uh, it's important that you go in with the same set of standards for that. Um, so that's one point. The second is that it is important, though, to recognize that philanthropy is risk capital. If we don't think about it as risk capital, if it's about preservation of capital, we're, we're a sector that's wildly, um, um, you know, under-resourcing a sector. And it is really important to have a risk conversation with your governing body about that. What is the philosophy about how you think about risk? And if you don't think about philanthropic capital as a risk for making social changes, maybe you don't want to be in the lending business, right? Because then you'll be in a conversation, well, it was high risk, and we didn't think they were going to make it anyways, and they didn't pay us back, and is this really a loan program, and is it really a grant program, and what is it? So um, I think part of it really does start with what are you trying to accomplish, and then the next part of it is really understand what you're trying to get done. Um, but you know, depending on where you are and how you come into an entity, if you're funding a not-for-profit or if you're funding a for-profit, those are different. Um, I, I do think the other point is, is really important, that you are betting on people, and you should give yourself the flexibility to do a workout. Um, sometimes the things did not happen as planned, but the vision and the capability is still there. And so are you willing to renegotiate that instrument and make it a success? And you have to have that flexibility going to it as well. I also, I just wanted to pick up on a comment that you made earlier as well, which is that you often, you're negotiating um, longer, talking to other investors, uh, to the in, uh, investee organization longer when you said you were going to publish the results of the independent study. So I would just say, you know, what are you trying to learn, right? And, and paint a picture with your board of, and this is what happened with this loan fund, which is, so what happened, what's the worst case scenario if the money doesn't come back to us, right? And for us, it was, we would have paid the $100,000 in the grant anyway. And so, you know, and so the worst case scenario was actually the downside risk wasn't there. But the, what the board said is, well, what happens if the residents don't pay back the loans? And I said, well, then there's probably a problem because we were hoping that the residents would be long-term employees at those schools. And so then there's a problem with the model. So what are you trying to learn? And what would you learn if, if those assumptions didn't play out? Yes, in the middle here. Um, so I, I 
the, all of these you know tips and best practices from your from your very varied experiences are are quite helpful. I'm wondering if either from your own organizations or I know there's no such thing as competitors in the nonprofit world, but from others, if you've seen any cautionary tales or worst practices, um, you know, easy pitfalls besides you know not doing adequate research, or the, the obvious. I'm curious if there's any. You know whether it's uh, uh, how not to do pay for success or how not to lease the you know building space to your grantees. Well, the only thing I would say is to measure your expectations when it comes to pay for success. Um, we applied for our first grant for technical assistance for pay for success from the nonprofit fund back in uh, March of 2014, I think, or 2015. Yeah, 2014, it's been about 18 months ago. And I, when we applied, thought I would have a transaction closed within six months. So I was unbelievably optimistic and incredibly naive about the complexity of this type of arrangement and the need for us to have understand outcomes in a much more um, rigorous, in-depth way. So I think that would be my big lesson learned of, of having realistic expectations about what needs to be done to really bring um, a back-end payer who would pay for the achievement of outcomes to the table. Uh, <clears throat> well, what I, we both talked about, you know, what a great safe investment CDFIs are. Um, not all of them. There's been, <clears throat> there are some terrible CDFIs out there and people have lost money. So just I want to make clear that, that it's just because someone has that designation doesn't mean that they can manage their capital well. I mean, I think you really need to you know, start out by very carefully separating your, you know, your mission hat and your investor hat and make sure that, depending on your outcome, you know, if you want this to be repaid, you've got to go into it, you know, putting all the mission stuff aside first and just making sure that you think this is a good investment. Um, and you have to have a really frank conversation with whoever you're investing in. I think there's, there's lots of stories of, you know, nonprofits receiving a, a PRI, you know, and signing on the dotted line that we owe the money, but in the back of their minds thinking, well, you know, they'll forgive it when, when things don't work out. I mean, they're a foundation. And, you know, so you've got to just very, very clear expectations on that front. Um, those are probably the, the best starting off advice. Um, I, I agree with what you just said. I, there's something called the prudent investor rule. And it's great to think that we're all venture capital out there and we're here to help nonprofits no matter what. Grants are, absolutely. But the asset base, up until about two weeks ago, the IRS scares us to death. I mean, we as, as board members on a foundation, investment committee members, we have a fiscal re fiduciary responsibility. Well, finally, the IRS is starting to realize, okay, if it's for a charitable purpose, we're going we're gonna to put you under a different microscope. So they're, they're lightening up this thing. But what I've, what I've tried to do is I've tried to show that you can invest your assets in the community in a very safe manner without taking risk at all, at all. And I think that's... That's what we're trying to get across here. We still make grants, and we're gonna, we'll push the envelope with those grants, and that's what we're going to do. But a lot of foundations want to be there in perpetuity, which is also a whole question. We can have a whole other discussion about that. I decided that they, they can't get rid of me now because I've invested 70% of the money right in, their own, right in assets to help nonprofits, so I have a reason to exist. But I, I really think it's important that we understand that those assets need to be invested safely, different than grants. And, and that's what you need to make your board members comfortable, people. Yeah. I think there's just a, a level of investment in the resources that will administer your program. You know, it's a learning exercise for the foundation as well as for the recipients of your investments. I think to the points that Eric made, you know, making sure that the folks that you're investing in understand the repayment structures and are ready to accommodate that. There's a lot of infrastructure building and getting folks up to speed on these new programs. Yeah. Any final questions? I think we have time for one more in the room. 
Um, thanks so much for this, first of all. And one of the things that we've been supporting is the California Human Development Report. And one of its recent conclusions is that California's GDP has increased by 134% over the past 20, 25 years. But median personal earnings for the average household has only increased by 7% during that same amount of time. So what message do you give to donors to incentivize them to give, given the economic climate that we're in? I mean, I, I've I've been <laughs> I've been doing a thing in speeches lately where I ask everyone to, you know, everyone in the room that, um, you know, someone said yes to and funded your startup, please stand up. Everyone who's said someone said yes, I'll help you pay for college, you know, and eventually you have everyone standing up, and you know, you say that, why isn't that, you know, that's not happening for our clients. No one's saying yes to them. Uh, but I, you know, and. A third of Californians have less than $500 in the bank. I mean, we all know this stuff. I don't know how you motivate people to, I mean, to do more, more, yeah. Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> well, as, as, a, um, as a venture philanthropy firm, we're out raising money every five years, and I think it's actually an incredible thing to do because it gives you a lot more empathy for the nonprofits that you support because you understand just what it's like to be in meeting after meeting. Um, and a slow road to know is just incredibly painful. Um, and so when you experience that firsthand, you know that you know maybe the pounded two by four, when I worked in the venture business, you know, we're not gonna do this and here's why, and here's some suggestions is something really worthwhile. I have found that, um, that philanthropists are incredibly generous, but it really has to do with trust. So people have looked at us and said, why is it that you've been able, we've been just incredibly fortunate to raise $50 million in, inside of a year um, to fund, in, fund innovation. And we're going to venture capitalists and to entrepreneurs who made their own money by funding innovation, by having people say yes to them. And I do think that this, the um, income inequality in the United States is troubling to them. Um, uh, if, if our presidential candidates are not, um, <laughs> they are, it's very troubling to them. Um, and so they are looking for solutions, innovative new solutions that are gonna help address that income inequality or climate change, these intractable long-term problems. And philanthropy is starting to show some real results in this area. And so the small stories that we can tell um, and the encouragement that we can give philanthropists, to, and especially new philanthropists, that make a couple of bets. Go in deep with a couple of nonprofits, build trust with them, and then they're gonna do more of it. Um, and I do think that we need to be very rigorous and income and focused because I do think that this next generation of philanthropists are incredibly focused on what did you accomplish with my dollars? And you have, they, the nonprofit leaders, and we as recipients of grant funds have to be able to say, you gave us $100 million, we said we we're gonna fund 65 organizations and we're gonna have 10 or 20% that are gonna be extraordinarily, extraordinary. And we need to go back to the market with that in the same way that WOTC or Care Message has to say, we said we were gonna serve 300 patients, or 3 million patients, and we did. And here's the depth of that impact. So I just think that the, the sector needs to, I mean, Eric's results are, is why he's attracting capital. Um, and I do think the results need to be there in order for the, and the, the funds will flow. Can I say, I, I just walked outside, just find more naming opportunities. That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just comment that um, in addition to naming opportunities, I would say, <laughs> I, th I fundamentally believe that the only way we're going to really attract new investors in a philanthropic way um, is by being far more disciplined about the impact of the services and the cost. And making value statements that say, it will cost $22,000 a year to take one juvenile who's been released from the juvenile detention system and having that you know, juvenile now in successful employment two years later. We have to be bold both as um, nonprofit leaders and philanthropic leaders to say, here is the cost value return on investment. We believe with this level of investment, 
90% of the children will show up to kindergarten ready for school. And I think we are only at the beginning um, and only in certain isolated examples able to make those types of precise value statements for the services. And that is, I think, the challenge of the next you know, 10 or 15 years for the nonprofit sector to be far more disciplined and to be transparent. I will say one last thing. I met with um, the executive director of a nonprofit in Orange County who is doing incredible work and has a 90% um, rate of successful transition of juvenile youth. And she said, it costs us 22,000 over two years to get you know, this juvenile to be secured either in employment or education. I can't tell people it costs that much. I'm like, you absolutely have to tell people it costs that much. Because if you, we can invest that much, that outcome is worth it. It's worth that $22,000. So I think there, we need to move the sector in that way. You know, I think um, the, the, the stories you've heard today are innovations, they're disruptions. Um, they are not closing the opportunity gap in a systematic way, as your question sort of posited. Um, I do think that this sector does have a very important role, and it's been touched on here, but worth maybe just uh, emphasizing, and that is that you cannot solve systematic problems for people without them at the table designing those solutions. And it's a lesson we have learned and forget. And yes, measurement's important. And yes, transparency is important. And trying all these different ways to utilize capital is important. But we have a very, very economically, and frankly, a demographic barbell in the state of California. And there are so many people that don't know people like somebody else that you're trying to solve a problem for. And part of what philanthropy can do, frankly, is to have those exchanges actually happen so that entrepreneurs and people who have capital that want to do something good actually understand the circumstances that we're trying to do in closing the opportunity gap. And that really is a very, I mean, innovation's important and all the things we've talked about are important, but they're tools. And what you're talking about is something a little bit more profound than that, I think. I want to take one more crack because I was so incoherent before. <laughs> I know. Uh, I mean, philanthropy can't clo close the opportunity gap or even come close. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about allocation of resources at the governmental level. And so if you want to invest as a philanthropist in closing the opportunity gap, it's got to be some kind of political social movement that's going to change how we uh, divvy up the pie. Thank you all for the time here today. Thank you to our panelists. Fantastic job, all of you. And I think folks will be around for questions. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>